I came into the world not only under the guilt of that offense in which many, nay all, were made sinners, and on the account of which judgment passed upon all men to condemnation, Romans 5.19, but moreover I brought with me a nature wholly corrupted, a heart wholly set in me to do evil, Job 14, verse 4, Psalm 51, 5, Ecclesiastes 9, 3. Of this the testimony of God and the word satisfies me, and herein I am strongly confirmed by undoubted experience that fully convinces me that from the morning of my days, while under the advantage of gospel light, the inspection of godly parents, and not yet corrupted by custom, the imaginations of my heart and the tenders of my life were evil, only evil, and continually so. Genesis 6, 5, Genesis 8, 21. It cannot be expected that, at so great a distance, I should remember the particulars of that first three or four years of my life. Yet I may, on the most just grounds, presume that they were filled up with those sins that cleave to children in their infancy, many of which are not only evil as they flow from a poisoned root, for an evil tree will bring forth corrupt fruit, Matthew 7, verse 17, but to also bear the impress of and an evident congruity to their corrupted source and taste strong of that root of bitterness whereon they grow. While we are yet on the breasts, inbred corruption breaks forth. And before we give any tolerable evidence that we are rational, we give full evidence that we are corrupted. Psalm 58, verse 3. We show that we are inclined to evil by pressing with impatience and eagerness for what is hurtful, and our aversion to good by refusing with the greatest obstinacy what is fit, proper, and useful to us. At first we are only employed about sensible things, and about them we give the first evidences that our natures are corrupt. And with the first appearances of reason, the corruption of our spirit discovers itself. How early do our actings discover passion, pride, revenge, dissimulation, and sensuality to be inlaid, as it were, in our very constitution? Any ordinary observer may discern instances innumerable of this sort very early in children. With these and the like evils, no doubt, were the first years of my life whereof I remember little filled up. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Proverbs 22, 5. Psalm 58, verse 3. In this first period of my life, I had advantages above most. My parents were eminently religious. I was trained up under their eyes and in inspection. For the most part, I continually heard the sound of divine truths ringing in my ears, in their instructions, and I had the beauty of the practice of religion continually represented to my eyes in their walk. I was by their care kept from ill company that might infect me. By these means I was restrained from those grosser outbreakings that children often run into. Habituated to a form of religion and put upon the performing of such outward duties of religion as my years were capable of. Hence it appears that the sin, I am now fully convinced, that I wallowed in during this period of time is not to be imputed either as to inclination or actings, merely to contracted custom or occasional temptations, but it was really the genuine fruit and result of that lamentable bias with which man since the fall is born. Surely the spring must be within, when notwithstanding all the care taken to keep me from them, I impetuously went on in sinful courses. The Holy Ghost hedged up my way by precepts, example, and discipline, but I broke through it all. Surely the spring must be within, 
and surely it must be very strong that was able to bear down such powerful mounds as were set in its way by the providence of God, and run with so full a stream, notwithstanding that all outward occasions of its increase were cut off as much as might be. Herein I have a full evidence of a heart naturally estranged from, nay opposite to, the Lord. Besides, this deeply aggravates my guilt, and they have turned unto me the back, and not the face. Though I taught them rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. Jeremiah 32, verse 33. The care of my father during his life, which ended October 1682, and of my mother after his death, though very great, did not change but only hide nature, which is indeed often hidden, sometimes overcome, but seldom extinguished. Albeit I cannot remember all the particulars from the fourth or fifth year of my life, yet so far do I remember what the general bent of my heart was from that time. Upon a review I must confess that it was wholly set against the Lord. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans 8, verse 7. To confirm this, when I now surveyed the Decalogue and reviewed this portion of my time, notwithstanding the great distance, I do distinctly remember, and were it to be edification, could condescend upon particular instances of the opposition of my heart unto each of its precepts. Whatever influence education may have in molding what is seen, yet surely the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Genesis 8.21 True it is, through the influence of the means before mentioned, I did all this while abominate the more gross breaches of all the commands and dislike open sin, but meanwhile my heart was set upon the less discernible violations of the same holy law. My quarrel was not with sin, but the consequences of it, and the main thing I regarded was the world's opinion of it. Fear of punishment, pride that fears to be ill thought of, or at best a natural conscience enlightened by education, were the only springs of any performances of duty or abstinence from sin. Prone I was all this while to sin, even of all sorts which that age is carried into in secret, when I could say that no eye shall see me, Job 24.15. They who, for credit or other such inducements, may seem averse to sin, you will make bold in the dark with the worst sins. Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery? For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord has forsaken the earth, Ezekiel 8, verse 12. Even though things which in my way seem good and promising, such as detestation of gross sins, performance of duties, and so on, were either purely the effects of a forcible custom, a bribe to a natural conscience to hold its peace, a sacrifice to self, a slavish performance of what I took no delight in to avoid the whip, or sometimes a charm to keep me from danger which I thought would befall me, and dreaded much if I neglected prayer. Thus my best things dreadfully increased my guilt, being like the apples of Sodom, fair to look at, promising while untried, but within full of ashes and noisome matter. When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those seventy years, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? And when you did eat and when you did drink, did you not eat for yourselves? Zechariah 7, verses 5 and 6. Bring no more vain oblations, incense is an abomination to me, the new moons and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies I cannot away with, it is iniquity, even the solemn meeting, Isaiah 1, verse 13. Thus, 
the spring of corruption damned in on the one side, I mean as to open profanity, by the mounds of education, breaks out on the other side in a form of religion without, nay plainly opposite to, the power of it, which is no less hateful to the holy God. The prayer of the wicked is sin. His sacrifice an abomination, Proverbs 21, verse 27. Sin, in the one case, has a little varnish that hides its deformity somewhat from the eyes of men. In the other, it is seen in its native hues and colors. In the one case, it runs underground. In the other, it openly follows its course. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after, First Timothy 5, verse 24. Whether the one or the other, the odds are not great. The tree is known by his fruit, Matthew twelve thirty three. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit, Matthew 7, verse 18. Sometimes it may bring forth good-like fruit, but yet, after all, I must confess that such was the strength of corruption that it drove me to several of the more plain and gross sins incident to this age, which, though some account pardonable follies in children, yet the Lord makes another reckoning of them. Sundry of them have been made bitter to me, such as lying to avoid punishment, Sabbath, breaking, revenge, hatred of my reprovers, and others of a light nature. Some particular sins committed in childhood, which I had quite forgot, as being attended with no notable circumstances that could make them stick rather than in other things, and being of an older date than anything else I can remember, were brought fresh to my remembrance when the Lord began closely to convince of sin. Being presented in their native colors in the light of the Lord and in all the circumstances of time, place, partners in sin, and so on, these sins were made the manner of my deep humiliation, loathing, and self-abhorrence, as not only full of wickedness in themselves, but pregnant evidences of the deepest natural depravity. This made me see to whom it was owing, that I went not to all the heights in wickedness and the grossest abominations that ever any were carried to, and which a haughty heart, if not restrained seasonably, partly by secret power and partly by outward means, would inevitably have carried me to. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Proverbs 22, verse 15, Deeply rooted and fastened there and no thanks to the best that are kept from the worst things. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me, and blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed is the Lord God of Israel liveth, which has kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hadst come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall, First Samuel 25, verses 32 to 34. What a monster had I been if left to myself and not seasonably restrained by outward means and inward power. Blessed be the invisible hand and the outward instruments of this restraint that kept me back from sinning. These are but a very few of the innumerable evils that cleave to me in this sinful period of my life, for who can understand his errors? Psalm 19.12 This period was altogether sinful and vain. Nay, sin and vanity in the abstract. Childhood is vanity, Ecclesiastes 11.10. And all this is deeply aggravated by my ignorant unconcernedness about them all the while. Notwithstanding all these sins, I was pure in mine own eyes, and yet not washed from my filthiness in the puddle whereof I had long wallowed. Proverbs 30, verse 12. I was whole as to my own sense, though the plague sore ran upon me. 
While I thought I stood in need of nothing, I was wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Revelation 3 verse 17. How canst thou say I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done, and so on. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. Jeremiah 2, verse 23, and 34 to 35. Reflections on this first period. When I consider how many sins long since done and forgotten, many of them of an older date than anything else I remember, and in their commission attended with no such remarkable circumstances as can rationally be supposed to have been made any deep impression on the memory, and so of any influence in their recovery after so long oblivion, were now by the Lord brought to mind with unusual distinctness. I cannot but herein observe, first, what exact notice the Holy God takes, and how deeply he resents those things which men generally will scarcely allow to be false, or at most but small ones, pardonable follies rather than sins. God early observed that man's imaginations are evil from his youth, and will have us mind and be humbled for the sins that have cleaved to us from our youth. This has been thy manner from thy youth that thou obeyest not my voice, Jeremiah 22, verse 21, is an aggravation of other sins he charges on his people, and in itself one heavy article. Number two, how much reason is there for reckoning it up as one great part of the wicked's misery, that they lie down in their graves with bones full of the sins of youth, Job 20, verse 11. How much reason is there for David's prayer that God may not remember against him the sins of his youth? Psalm 25, verse 7. How just reason have we often with Job to say that in the strokes that fall on us in riper years, God is making us to possess the iniquities of our youth? Job 13, verse 26. How much reason have we, with holy Augustine, to confess and mourn over the sins of childhood, and trace original corruption in his first outbreakings, even to infancy, Augustine's confessions? I have observed what an exact register conscience God's deputy keeps, how early it begins to mark, how accurate it is, even when it seems to take no notice, and to what length it will go in justifying God's severity against sinners at the last day, how distinctly and clearly conscience will read it out, and how far up it will fetch its accounts of those evils which we remember nothing of, when God shall open its eyes to read what is written, and discern those prints which, as Job says, God sets upon the heels of our feet, Job 13.27, and give a commission to tell us of them when the books shall be opened, and the dead, small and great, judged out of them, Revelations 20.12. When I review this first period of my life, what reason do I see to be ashamed and even confounded to think that I have spent ten years of a short life without almost a rational thought, and undoubtedly any that was not sinful? After that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yet even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of my youth, Jeremiah 31, verse 19. The whole of what I have set down, before being matter of undoubted experience, of which I can no more doubt than of what I now see and feel, I have herein a strong confirmation of my faith as to the guilt of Adam's sin, its imputation to his posterity, and of my involvement in it, in particular, for number one, the bent of my soul from a child was set against the Lord. Nor was this the effect of custom and education, for there was a sweet conspiracy of precept, discipline, and example of those with whom I conversed during this first part of my life to carry me another way. 
nor can I charge the fault of this on my constitution of body, or any such thing as might be alleged to proceed from my parents in a natural way. For those lusts which are of the mind and are not influenced by any constitution of body were as strong, sensible, active, and prevalent as any other, nay, more than those which may be pretended to depend on the frame of the body, Ephesians 2, verse 3. And as my soul in its accursed inclinations was thus opposite to the Lord, so the opposition was of that strength and force as was not to be suppressed, much less to be overcome and subdued by the utmost care of parents and the best outward means. This is an undoubted fact. I cannot at all conceive it consistent with the wisdom, goodness, or equity of God to send me thus into the world without any fault on my part, to say I was thus originally framed without respect to any sin chargeable on me is a position so full of flat contradiction to all the notions I can entertain of the deity that I cannot think of it without horror, much less can I believe and give assent to it. Penal, then, this corruption must be, as death and diseases are. And whereof can it be a punishment if not of Adam's sin? Well, though things are so plain in fact, and the, and the deduction so easy from them, whatever subtle arguments any use to overthrow this truth, I have no reason to be much shaken or moved with them, or call the truth in question. If once I am sure that God has done a thing, there is no room left for disputing its equity. I am sure I was corrupt from my infancy. I am sure God could not have made me so without cause or sent me into the world in such a case if it had not been for some fault wherein I am concerned. If there is any attempt to charge God on the score, I look upon it as highly injurious. There is no more left for me in this case, but humbly to endeavor to clear God of any seeming hardship. If I cannot easily do this, then I will much rather own my ignorance and stoop under his incomprehensibility than lay any charge of injustice against him. This has stayed my soul against the most subtle arguings of men of perverse minds and even of Satan, who has often assaulted me in this point. Be their arguments what they will. Behold, in this they are not just. I will answer thee that God is greater than man. Why dost thou strive against him? For he giveth not an account of any of his manners. That he may withdraw man from this, among other evil purposes, of measuring God by his short line and hide pride from his eye. Job 33, 12, 13, and 17. Hence also I am taught what estimate to make of the pretended good and virtuous inclinations wherewith some are by deists and Pelagians alleged to be born. If it be not in those few and rare instances of the early efficacy of sanctifying grace, all that which is looked on as good is really no more than the fruit of education, custom, occasional restraints, freedom from temptation, or perhaps a natural temper influenced by some of these, and by the constitution of the body to somewhat of opposition to those grosser actings of sin, which make the most noise in the world. In a word, whatever there is of this, save in the rare instances before mentioned, is but sin under a disguise. The odds are not great. The one sort of sinners seem to promise good fruit, but deceive, whereas the openly profane give a plain refusal and forbid expectations. And yet of this last sort more receive the gospel than of the former. What, what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not, but afterwards he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father, they say unto him, The first Jesus saith unto them, 
Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you, Matthew 21, 28 to 31. Part 2 containing an account of the rise, progress, interruptions, revivals, and issues of the Lord striving with me during the 10 or 11 ensuing years of my life from May 1685 to August 1696. Chapter 1. Containing an account of the first rise of any concern about religion, its results, revivals, and other occurrences thereto relating for the first two years of this time. In the month of May 1685, my mother being by the heat of the persecution obliged to retire to Holland, I went along with her. While we were at sea, being in some real or apprehended danger, my conscience which had for all the bygone ten years so far as I can now remember, been fast asleep, began to awaken. I was challenged for sin, terrified with the apprehensions of hell and death and the wrath of God, which I had no thought about before I was brought to this distress. They have turned their back unto me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble they will say, Arise and save us, Jeremiah 2, verse 27. All this concern was nothing more than a sad mixture of natural fear and a selfish desire of preservation from the danger that was supposed imminent, at least by me. Peace, acceptance, communion with God came not much in my thoughts. I was afraid and unwilling to die. I would gladly have been out of danger of hell. This was all my exercise at this time. It was not sin, but death, its consequence. I was concerned to be rid of. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once, and entreat the Lord your God that you may take away from me this death only. Exodus 10, verses 16 and 17. As this exercise was wholly selfish, without any concern for the Lord's glory, so it led me to selfish courses for relief. I promised that, were I at land, I would live and be better than formerly. I engaged to keep all God's commands. My mother told me I was mistaken and would not hold there. But there was no persuading one so ignorant of his own heart, as I at this time was of this. I multiplied engagements and doubted not myself as to the performance. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, verse 16, 19, and 21. No sooner was I come to land and fixed at Rotterdam, but I verified what I had been foretold. I forgot all my promises and resolutions. The unrenewed and corrupt heart being free from the force put upon it by the natural conscience, under appearance of hazard, took its old course. I returned to former evils and grew worse. Corruption that had been dammed up for a little, having easily forced down all these mounds raised to hold it in, ran with the greater violence. It is true through the mercy of God I was still restrained from open and scandalous sins, toward which the awe of my godly and prudent mother and principles of education did contribute not a little. But as to secret evils of all sorts, I had no aversion to them, Nay, to many of them I was strongly inclined, and in many instances followed my own inclinations. I was a ready and easy prey to every temptation, notwithstanding all my resolutions. And thou sayest, I will not transgress, when upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest, playing the harlot. Jeremiah 2, verse 20. 
My sins in this place had this grievous aggravation that they were against greater light and more of the means of grace than I had formerly enjoyed. On the Lord's Day we had three sermons and two lectures in the Scots Church. On Thursday a sermon there likewise. On Tuesday one of the suffering ministers by turns preached. There was a meeting for prayer on Wednesday. On Monday and Friday night, Mr. James Kirkton commonly lectured in his family. On Saturday, he catechized the children of the Scots sufferers who came to him. My mother took care to have me attend most of these occasions, was careful to keep me to duty, was not wanting in advice, correction, and prayer with and for me. She obliged me to read the scriptures and other edifying books. But so far were all these from obtaining a due effect on me that I was weary of them and went on in sin. What could have been done more, namely in terms of outward means, to my vineyard, that I have not done in it? Therefore, when I looked at it, it should have brought forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes, Isaiah 5, verse 4. He said also, namely of the Lord's service, Behold, what a weariness is it! And ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn and the lame and the sick. Thus ye brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? Malachi 1 verse 13. At this time I did not lack frequent convictions, occasioned sometimes by the preaching of the word, and at other seasons by the light of my education, which still hung about me, and was a check upon me. But all these were only like the starts of a sleeping man occasioned by some sudden noise. Up he gets, but presently he is down and faster asleep than before. I found means to get rid of these convictions. Number one, I would, when they were uneasy, promise them a hearing afterwards. And as Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Acts 24, verse 25. Number two, at other seasons I looked to the tendency of them, that they aimed at engaging me to be holy, and then I poured upon the difficulties of that course, till I not only got the edge of my convictions blunted, but frightened myself from complying. The slothful man saith, There is a lion without, I shall be slain in the streets. Proverbs 22, verse 13. Number 3. When convictions were lighter, I got rid of them by withdrawing from the means. If any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. James 1, 23 and 24. Number 4. Sometimes I promised him fair, and so put off at the time, but minded it not afterwards. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Matthew 21, verse 30. Number 5. Sometimes they issued in fruitless, inactive, and slothful wishes. The soul of the sluggard desires and has nothing. The desire of the slothful kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. Proverbs 13, 4. Proverbs 21, verse 25. Number 6. At other times when they were troublesome, I turned my eye to something which I thought good in my way. Though the Lord knows little was there that I had so much as any tolerable appearance of good. Yet so foolish was I that I rested here, as if this had been not only enough to atone for bygones, but to procure good at God's hand. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, and so on, Luke 18, verses 10 to 12. 
Number seven. Sometimes I endeavor to diminish my sin as much as I could. In all my labors they shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. Hosea 12, 8. Number eight. When these shifts failed and they were still uneasy, I then betook myself to diversion, and they choked the word and convictions from it. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. Luke 8, 14. About this time I met with some things that crossed me. Hereon I turn thoughtful what way to rid myself of these difficulties. I seemed more than ordinarily concerned, and my spirit was much troubled. Yet really this strait led me not to God. But my thoughts were spent in resentments against the real or supposed authors of my uneasiness, in proud, selfish, and vain contrivances for mine own ease and relief. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Psalm 10, verse 4. They cry out by reason of the arm of the mighty. But none saith, Where is God my maker, who giveth songs in the night? Job 35, 9 and 10. And thou didst look in that day to the armor of the house of the forest. But ye have not looked unto the maker thereof, neither have respect to him that fashioned it long ago. Isaiah 22, 8 and 11. About the month of December, 1686, upon an earnest desire of my father's sister, married to John Glass, provost of Perth, I was sent home. While I stayed in this family, I saw nothing of religion, though my aunt was a woman very moral. Here I was much indulged. I got liberty, and I took it. I saw little of the worship of God, and I easily complied and turned remiss, too. What further advances toward an open rejection of the very form of religion I made in this place, I do not now, at this distance, distinctly remember. But no doubt they were great. This I do remember, that I found my aversion sensibly weakened to those sins which, through the influence of education, I detested before. Yea, I found some secret hankering after some of them, a delight in those who were guilty of them, and a sort of approbation of them in my heart. Yet still I was in a great measure restrained from an avowed practical compliance by the awful impressions early instruction had left on my mind which were not as yet wholly worn off, though they were far decayed, considering the shortness of my stay, whence I may easily discern what had become of them if I had stayed longer here. Further, I mind that at this time I had a great aversion to learning, which was the only thing that in this place was urged upon me. I looked on it as a burden and drudgery to which the basest employments were to be preferred, and hence I no way set my heart to it, but trifled my time away. And many a sinful shift did I betake myself to, that I might get the time shuffled over, seeing thou hatest instruction, and casteth my words behind thee, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest I was altogether such an one as thyself. Psalm 50, verse 17 to 18 and 21. Thus I spent the winter. In the spring of 1687, my mother, fearing that I might be ensnared with the company I was now amongst, came home for me as minding the wise man's observation. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Proverbs 29, verse 15. But so great was my wickedness that in spite of natural affection I was grieved at her return, and when first I heard her voice it depressed me. I did not care to see her. Nothing I dislike more than a godly and affectionate mother's conversation. 
I feared to be questioned as to the past. I feared she would carry me away back to Holland, whereby I should be put under uneasy restraints from my sinful liberty. But thou sayest, there is no hope, no, for I have loved strangers, and after them I will go. Jeremiah 2, verse 25. In the spring or toward summer, my mother carried me with her, much against my will, and put me to school there at Erasmus School. I stayed but a short while there. But the advantageous method of teaching stuck with me. I began to delight in learning and quickly turned proud of my success, but otherwise lived as I had done before, still worse and worse, under all the means God made use of to bring me near and to keep me close to him. As a girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, that they might be unto me for a people, and for a name, and for a praise, and for a glory, but they would not hear. Jeremiah 13, verse 11, the end of chapter 1 of the life of Thomas Halliburton. We are continuing the reading of the conversion of Thomas Halliburton. Chapter 2, containing an account of the revival of convictions, their effects, progress, issues, and interruptions from the close of 1687 to 1690 or 91 when I went from Perth to stay at Edinburgh. In the month of February 1687, King James omitted his proclamations for indulgence. Consequently, most of those who had fled ventured home and my mother, amongst others, toward August or September of that year. It had been for my advantage, probably, for my education to have stayed here, which made me unwilling to return. In our return, we were in imminent danger of shipwreck on the scars of England, but by the mercy of God escaped. The danger was sudden and suddenly over, and so left little or no impression on me. When we came home, we fixed at Perth and abode there till harvest 1690 or 1691. I cannot be positive which. What was my case as to my sole concerns during this time, so far as I remember, I shall here narrate. Presently upon our settlement in this place, I entered into school and made some better proficiency than before. But as to religion, I continued as unconcerned as ever as intent upon sin, as averse to duty, as formerly. Though I was kept while under my mother's eye, when I was among my comrades, I took my liberty and went with them into all the follies and extravagances they went into, but with this aggravation above most of them, that what I did I knew to be a fault very often, whereas they, at least many of them, did not. Yea, not only went I along with them, but was foremost and enticed others to folly. Yet still, through the mercy of God, I was kept from openly scandalous evils, except once that I remember when with some other boys I was seized in the garden for taking some fruit. I was much ashamed of this and never attempted it again, not from any real dislike of the sin, but out of fears of getting caught, and thus I continued till toward the close of King James' reign, when fears of a massacre or some sudden stroke from the papists, whereof there was then a great noise everywhere, revived my concern about religion. But when he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God, and they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. Psalm seventy-eight, thirty-four, and 35. This concern being somewhat deeper, and the effects of it more remarkable and lasting, I shall endeavor to give a distinct account of it. About this time the Lord, by the means I lived under, the preaching of the word and catechizing in public and private, enlightened my mind further in the notional knowledge of the law and gospel. My capacity growing with my years and knowledge of what was sin and what was duty, 
of what the fearful consequences of sin were and the advantage of duty increasing, sin was left open and naked without the excuse of ignorance and conscience had a further advantage, being armed with more knowledge and better informed. Hereupon its checks, when now by the Lord's providences it was in some measure awakened, were more frequent and sharp and not so easily to be evaded. If I had not come and spoken to them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. John 15, verse 22. Some touches of sickness riveted on me the impressions of mortality and frailty and the tendency of each of those numerous trains of diseases by which we are daily exposed to death. Hereon I was brought into and kept under continual bondage through fear of death. Hebrews 2.15 But that which above all affected me most deeply and gave an edge to convictions were the continual fears we were in of being suddenly destroyed by the papists. This kept death in its most terrible shape ever in my eyes and thoughts. And to my great terror, I saw wrath and judgment following it. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Isaiah 33, 14. Herein I was cast into grievous disquietment. I took counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily. Psalm 13, verse 2. I was in a dreadful strait between two things. On the one hand, my convictions of sin were sharp. Fears of present death and judgment quickened them. This made me attend more to the word. The more I attended to it, they increased the more, and I was daily persuaded more and more that there was no way to be rid of them but by turning religious. On the other hand, if I should engage in earnest with religion, then I saw the hazard of suffering for it, and knew not but I might be called immediately to die for it, and this I could not think of doing. Between the two I was dreadfully tossed in my own mind. Some nights sleep went from my eyes, and I was full of trouble. I set imagination at work, and did sometimes strongly impress myself with the fancy of an Irish cutthroat, holding a dagger to my breast, and offering me these terms. Quit your religion. Turn papist, and you shall live. Hold it, and you are dead. The imagination was sometimes so strong that I have almost fainted with it, and still I was dreadfully unresolved what to do. Sometimes I would let him give the fatal stroke, but hereon my spirit shrank, and my heart failed at the apprehensions of death. At other times I resolved to quit my religion, but with resolution to take it up again when the danger was over. Yet this gave me no rest. What I thought if the treacherous enemy destroy me after I have done it, and so I lose both life and religion. And what if I die before the danger is over, and so time be not allowed me to repent? Ephraim is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. Hosea 7, 11. This sort of exercise frequently recurred, and I continued this way at times, even till after the battle of Kilikrunkri, which was fought July 27th, 1689. It had some interruptions, and then I was remiss as before. But for nearly a year, few weeks and frequently few days or nights passed over me without some such exercise. But the fears of the papists being quickly over, my remaining difficulty was only with my convictions. Now as to these, I endeavored to relieve myself, number one, by promises of abstaining from those sins which most directly cross my light, and for which I was most plainly challenged. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron, and said, Entreat the Lord for me, and I will let you go. Exodus nine twenty-seven and 28. 
Number two, I took sanctuary in resolutions of inquiring into the Lord's mind and complying. But when I consulted any practical book or the ministry of the word, and found them not to give such directions as agreed with my unrenewed heart, I was grieved and stuck there. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Matthew 19, verses 16, and verses 21 and 22. Number 3. I thought to find peace and a more careful attendance upon duties. Thus being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish mine own righteousness, I submitted not myself unto the righteousness of God, nor showed I any regard to Christ, who is the end of the law for righteousness, to every one that believeth. Romans 10, verses 3 and 4. Though my foolish heart ran to those courses, yet really they afforded me no solid repose. For number 1. The first sin against light and the first omission of duty, which very speedily ensued upon the intermission of the force that present convictions put on me, shook all, and I was confounded at the thought of appearing before God in a righteousness so plainly ragged, that where it had one piece it wanted two, Isaiah 64, 6. Number two. Though these ways gave some ease where trials were at a distance, Yet when the thoughts of death came near, I found no peace here. This was not gold tried in the fire, nor would it abide so much as a near-hand view of a trial, but at the very appearance of a storm, the sandy foundation shook. Matthew 7, 27. Number 3. Whenever convictions were awakened as to new sins, challenges for old ones recurred, which showed that the cure was not perfect. Behold all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks. Walk in the light of your fire, and in the sparks that ye have kindled. This shall ye have of mine hand. Ye shall lie down in sorrow. Isaiah 50 verse 11 The effects of this exercise that abode and increased afterwards were principally these three. Number one, hereby I was brought into a doubt about the truths of religion the being of a God and things eternal. This hesitation was not from any arguments that offered themselves against these truths, or from any suspicion of ministers, parents, or others from whom I had received them, but merely from this, that whenever in danger or straits I would build on them, a suspicion secretly haunted me. What if these things are not? Once I was brought to think that I had not certainty and evidences about them answerable to the weight that was to be laid on them. I thought death and the trouble attending it were certain and sensible things. But I could not get my mind so satisfied and fully assured about the truths of religion. Still, when under apprehensions of death, I would have taken rest upon the truths of religion. The persuasion failed me, and my mind began to waver, though I could give no reason for this. The way of the wicked is his darkness. They know not at what they stumble. Proverbs 4, verse 19. Number 2. I was hereby persuaded, and this persuasion ever after increased in strength, that I can never have peace till I came to another sort of evidence and certainty about the truths of religion than I was acquainted with so far. Death I saw inevitable. It might be very sudden. I was capable of being impressed with the four thoughts of it and could not banish them. Therefore I concluded, unless I obtained such a conviction of religion and such an interest in it, as will make me not only look at death without fear, but go through it with comfort, it would be better for me had I never been. But how or where this was to be obtained, I was utterly uncertain. 
Here I lay in great perplexity under the melancholy impression that I had hitherto spent my money for that which is not bread, and my labor for that which satisfieth not, Isaiah 55, 2, number 3. This perplexity was somewhat eased, while one day reading near the end of the fulfilling of the scriptures, how Mr. Robert Bruce was shaken about the being of a god, and how at length it came to the fullest satisfaction. Hereby a hope secretly sprang up that one time or other, in one way or other, this might also befall me, and that the Lord might satisfy me in this. Here was the dawning of a light that, though it did not fully clear up for a long time, yet was never put wholly out again, though it was far from satisfying, yet it kept from despair as to the issue. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw aught, and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Mark 8 verses 23 and 24. But all this notwithstanding, the veil still remained untaken away. Second Corinthians 3, verses 14 and 15. About this time, one Mr. Donaldson, a reverend old minister, preached at Perth and came to visit my mother, called for me, and among other questions, he asked me if I sought a blessing on my learning. I ingeniously answered no, he replied with an austere look, Sir, unsanctified learning has done much mischief to the kirk of God. The saying stuck with me ever after and left a deep impression on me so that whenever I was any way straightened, I applied to God by prayer for help in my learning and pardon for not seeking his blessing. But this is only when more than ordinarily in difficulty. But as to the main, all this exercise left me where I was before, afar off from God, and an enemy to him in my mind, which I evidenced by wicked works. Colossians 1, verse 21. The life of Thomas Halliburton, especially his conversion, chapter 3, given an account of the increase of my convictions during my stay at Edinburgh from harvest, 1690 or 1691, till May 1693, in the vain refuges I betook myself to for relief. My mother designing to have me well educated for the advantage of better schools, in harvest 1690 or 91, moved to Edinburgh and fixed me at Mr. Gavin Ware's school, where I stayed, save only for the space of some months, that I abode in Carlop's family, and learned with his children and some others, under one who had been a teacher under Mr. Weir, and after his removal taught a few privately till November 1692, when I entered the college under Mr. Alexander Cunningham. Here it was my mercy that I fell in with sober comrades who were bookishly inclined. But this is not my design to narrate, and therefore I proceed to observe the steps of the Lord's work with me as to my soul. While I abode here, the Lord gave not over his dealings with me. About the time of forty years suffered he their manners in the wilderness, Acts 13, verse 18. Long also did he bear with my manners. In this place the work went on for, number one, as knowledge increased, so convictions, if not in force, yet in number increased. Still as knowledge of the law grew, which it daily did under the means of grace, the knowledge of sin also grew, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 7, verse 7. The Lord daily let me see that he was wroth on account of sins that I had not noticed formerly. These things I was done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest I was altogether such an one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Psalm 50, verse 21. Number 2. By new afflictions, the impressions of my mortality were riveted, and I was still the further in bondage through the growing fears of death. Hebrews 2, verse 15. Number 3. 
The word being daily preached and daily meeting with me forced me, though unwilling, to make some inquiry into my sincerity in religion, of which I now made some profession. A close word will at length even bring a Judas to say, Master, is it I? Matthew 26, verse 25, number 4. By the means of grace, Herod-like, to save some bosom idols, they engage me to do many things and hear the word gladly, Mark 6, verse 20. The means whereby these effects were wrought were, first, the preaching of the word. By the two-edged sword that goes out of his mouth, the Lord did often wound me, and the secrets of my heart were made manifest. Revelation 1, verse 16. I found the word a discerner of the thoughts of the heart and its intents, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 25, Hebrews 4, verse 12, number 2. The Lord made use of the rod. He laid his hand on me. When I was well and in health, the word did not affect me so much, nor did I attend it so carefully. I spake unto thee in thy prosperity, but thou sayest, I will not hear. This has been thy manner from thy youth, that thou obeyest, not my voice. Jeremiah 22, verse 21. In their affliction they will seek me early. Hosea 5, verse 15. If they be bound in fetters, and beholden in cords of affliction, then he showeth them their work and their transgressions, that they have exceeded. Job 36, 8 and 9. Number 3. I read Thomas Shepard's treatise called The Sincere Convert, which gulled me and cut me to the quick. It came home very close to me and affected me very much and put me to question deeply my sincerity. By these means I was driven sometimes to great extremity and carried the length of a form of religion. I prayed not only evening and morning, but at some other times I retired and would weep plentifully in secret and read and pray, and resolved to live otherwise than I had done. But this goodness was as a morning cloud in early dew, Hosea 6 verse 4. It kept pace with my convictions. It was force, not nature. The strictness lasted no longer than the force that occasioned it did. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. But Jehoiada waxed old and died. Now after the death of Jehoiada came the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols. Second Chronicles 24 verse 2, 15. 17 and 18. While I was under these distresses, many a wicked shift did I betake myself unto for relief, though without effect. When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian, and sent to King Jerob, yet could he not heal you, nor cure you of your wound, Hosea 5 verse 13. When searching marks were offered from the word which tended to discover my sinfulness, or when I read them in books, and if anything was spoken or mentioned that did an appearance make for me, then I was sorely vexed by that, for I was very unwilling to see my own hypocrisy, and therefore if I had but a show to found my claim, I laid hold on what was offered. Like the young man, when Christ spoke of keeping the commandments answered, being unacquainted with the spiritual extent of the law, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Matthew 19.20 So said I. Number 2 When I found something was required that I neither had nor resolved to comply with, because perhaps it was on some account or other scarce, then I resolved to compound the manner and make amends some other way and beg a license for that like Naaman. Thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods but unto the Lord. And this thing the Lord pardon thy servants, that when my master goeth into the house of Ramon to worship there and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Remon, Second Kings five seventeen and eighteen. 
Number three, when any mark was offered that I could not shift nor pretend unto, then I was ready to question whether he that offered it were not mistaken, and secretly questioned the truth, following the measures Satan took with Eve. Yea, has God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden, and again ye shall not surely die. Genesis 3, 1 and 4. Number four, when I could not see, not through the want of sufficient light, but through my unwillingness to admit it, I was ready to quarrel that ministers and books did not tell me plainly. Then came the Jews round about him, and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believed not. John ten twenty four and 25. Number 5. Sometimes when I was grappled with a mark, I promised it a hearing at a more convenient season. And so, like Felix, shifted the trouble for the time, Acts 24, verse 25, number 6. Sometimes I would slip over these things that made against me. Every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest its deed should be reproved, John 3, verse 20. Number 7. I carefully sought for the lowest marks and the least degrees of grace that might be saving. I designed only as much religion as would take me to heaven, and therefore I still inquired with the young man, What good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Matthew 19, verse 16. I desired no more than would do this, that would serve this turn, and anything that would serve this, provided my beloved lusts were spared. I would with him resolve upon. Number 8. When none of these shifts would avail in the general, I would resolve upon doing anything that the Lord required. Like him that said, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Luke 9, verse 57. But then with him I still retracted when the Lord, as he often did, did tell me of particulars. He would try me in, which were cross to my inclination. Number 9. When I saw I behooved to quit these, of which the Lord often convinced me, then I begged a little respite or delay, and I would comply, Augustine-like. I was content to be holy, but not yet. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Luke 9, verses 61 and 62. An excuse, a delay in God's account, is a plain refusal. For all commands and invitations require immediate obedience. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. And today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Hebrew 3, verse 15. Number 10. After all ways were tried, I found no relief. I blamed my education. I knew there was some change. My question was, was it the right one? Now I thought if I had not been religiously educated, but had turned all at once, it would have been more easily discernible. Thus I was entangled in my own ways. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the law like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. Isaiah 59, verses 9 and 10. And the true reason of my strait was, I was scorning and not really desirous of light. Unless it had been to my mind. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. Psalm 82, verse 5. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. Proverbs 14, verse 6. Many other deceits and shifts my heart used, which now at so great a distance I cannot remember. But these are the principle which do occur upon reflection. And in them how evident is it that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who knows or can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. Though now I seem sometimes to have gone far, yet really I was wholly wrong for number one, all this while being convinced of the necessity of a righteousness 
but ignorant of Christ, I sought it by the works of the law. Romans 10. Number 2. The carnal mind is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God. Romans 8 verse 7. Still continued. Number 3. All my exercise was only a tossing between light and love to sin, and sin still carried it. For my bosom idols I would by no means part with. Number four. Self was the animating principle of any form of religion that I had. So much of it as would save me from hell or take me to heaven and no more I desired. Number five. All this religion came and went with the occasions mentioned. It was not abiding. Providentially about this time, Clark's martyrology was cast into my hand. I loved history and read it greedily, and some impressions it left on me that wanted not their own use now and afterwards. First, the patience, joy, and courage of the martyrs persuaded me that there was a power, a reality in religion, beyond the power of mere nature. Number two. I was convinced that I was a stranger as yet to this because I could not think of suffering. Number three, I was brought to some faint desires after acquaintance with this power of religion. The Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And there is no other God that can deliver out of this sort. Daniel three twenty-eight and 29. Often was I, in reading this book, at Balaam's wish, Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. Numbers 23, verse 10. But like him, I love not their life. I observe that at this time, number one, God restrained me from many follies which others ran into, and to which I was much inclined to, by my bodily infirmity, a trouble in my joints which made me unable to go. Thus he hedged in my way, Hosea 2, verse 6, that I should not find my lovers. Number 2. The Lord in mercy provided me comrades that were tender of me. He fed me and led me, though I knew him not. Hosea 2, verse 8. Number 3. So far was I from being thankful that my proud heart fretted that I was kept from those things others followed. Isaiah 45. Five, verse 5. I would have been at rejoicing in my strength, and vexed I was that I had that occasion of glory and cut off. Jeremiah 2, verse 17. And I was not thankful either for the Lord's cutting off by this means many occasions of sin, or for his mercy in providing persons to take care of me. Oh, what reason have I to say the Lord is kind to the unthankful and to the evil?